Good afternoon. This is Cynthia Kanaki with the ALS Association. Thank you so much for carving time out of your busy day, particularly at the height of the summer season, to join us. Today's webinar is one of a series of monthly educational topic calls. They're all designed to bring information of practical nature to those living with ALS. Last month's webinar was related to traveling with ALS. Next month's webinar is going to be to talking with children and youth about ALS. But this month's webinar is carved out to address the challenges and options associated with communication. We're very pleased to have an expert in communication with us as our guest speaker today. Stephanie Barb is a master's prepared speech language pathologist. She's associated with the ALS Association Greater Chicago Chapter. Ms. Barb is going to be sharing practical information related to communication challenges associated with ALS and with maximizing options that are available to support quality communication during an ALS journey. I believe Ms. Barb is uh, already logged on. Uh, Stephanie, uh, I will turn this um, over to you, and you are certainly welcome to advance your slides at your convenience. Meanwhile, I will make another quick announcement that our lines are in mute mode and ask folks if they would submit their questions or comments in the chat box, and then we can have a discussion regarding those questions and comments at the end of your presentation. So, Stephanie, uh, you are certainly welcome to, to begin. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining today. As Cynthia said, um, my name is Stephanie, and I've been a speech pathologist for over 20 years now. And about 15 of those 20 years, I've had um, a focus or a passion for augmentative and alternative communication. Um, I worked for a speech generating device manufacturer for about 10 years as a local device consultant. And about two years ago, I decided to return to the field as a speech pathologist. I currently do some work for the um, Chicago chapter of the ALS Association, and I get the opportunity to support the communication needs of individuals living with ALS in central Illinois. Today, I'm going to chat with you guys about the changes that often occur in speech with ALS. And we'll also discuss some of the strategies and the solutions available that will hopefully promote successful communication throughout your journey with ALS. We'll start by defining communication as the exchange of thoughts, messages, or information that is through speech, signals, writing, or behavior. I really want to stress that um, communication is multimodal in that we all use more than one mode to communicate. We use a combination of things like speech and facial expressions, gestures, writing, and technology to communicate. We also commu uh, communicate for a variety of purposes, including to request, gather, and share information, we communicate to gain someone's attention and to protest. We communicate to express our feelings and to comment or state our opinions. We're going to, um, this, this is really going to be a, a general overview of changes that occur with speech in ALS. Certainly most of these topics that we are um, briefly touching on today could probably stand to have an entire hour or more on each of them. So if there are questions, as Cynthia mentioned earlier, please put those in the chat box. And at the end of the presentation, if I haven't answered your question, then we will, we will um, absolutely address those. So why do these changes with speech occur with ALS? Well, what we know is that ALS damages or destroys the nerve cells that control muscle movements. And when these motor neurons die, the brain's ability to initiate and control muscle movements is lost. This also includes, of course, the muscles that we use to produce speech. Um, these weakened muscles often result in slow or slurred speech, 
and they can result in reduced breath support, which can limit our ability to produce longer sentences on a single breath and could eventually lead to the, in uh, the inability to produce speech. The changes in speech often result in some communication challenges beyond the physical symptoms that I just identified. Um, it's important to recognize that there are also um, some psychological factors that um, result in the changes that occur with speech, such as some grief, definite feelings of frustration or social iso um, isolation, and the feeling of being dependent on others to interpret your thoughts or your feelings. I want to familiarize you with a few terms that you may hear along um, your journey with ALS. I know that um, as a speech pathologist and um, as a group of professionals familiar with these terms, we often use them without necessarily always thinking that the person we're having the conversation with doesn't necessarily know these terms. So um, I want to, to identify some of these terms and, terms and demystify um, what they mean. Um, the first one that I want to discuss is the term dysarthria, and that's the name of the condition um, where the muscles that we use for speech are weak, and that results in that slow or slurred speech that can often become difficult to understand. You may hear the term SLP used, and that just stands for speech language pathologist. Um, SLPs are the specialists who evaluate and treat individuals with speech language, cognitive communication, and swallowing disorders. Um, you may hear the term AAC, which stands for Augmentative and Alternative Communication. And we will absolutely touch on AAC. Um, we'll, we'll take a deeper dive into AAC. Um, SGD is Speech Generating Device. And again, when we discuss AAC um, in, um, in more detail, we will also discuss SGDs, or speech generating devices. You may hear the terms message and voice banking used. And this is a process of creating digital recordings, which is message banking, or a customized digital voice which is voice banking, um, which can later be imported or installed um, on a speech generating device. You may also hear the term alternative access used. And we often refer to alternative access when we are discussing different ways that speech generating devices or technology can be accessed when traditional means um, are not able to be used. So if you're not able to use your hands perhaps to access a screen, we might talk about alternative access or other ways that you can control those systems. Since we will be talking quite a bit about Augmentative and Alternative Communication, or AAC, I will provide you with um, one definition of AAC, which is any device, system, or method that improves a person's ability to communicate effectively and to participate in the world around them. Um, there's this, a statistic that says that approximately 80% of individuals with ALS will eventually use some sort of AAC to either supplement or replace speech. Um, I've used this um, for many, many years, um, this quote by the American Speech and Language and Hearing Association about why AAC is important. And it states that all persons, regardless of the extent or severity of their disabilities, have a basic right to affect through communication the conditions of their own existence. AAC is, is a way for an individual to continue to communicate, um, to do all of those functions that um, I discussed a few slides ago, to, to be able to request and gather and share information, to gain attention and to protest, to, protest, um, to express feelings and opinions and comment. Um, AAC provides a way 
to keep that conversation going um, using the individual's own words, thoughts, and ideas. Um, Yorkston, Miller, and Strand identified some stages of intervention specifically related to um, changes in speech which often occur with ALS. My plan is to take a peek at each of these stages identified and, and discuss a plan of action or strategies for each stage. This is really just meant to be a general guideline for you to, to be aware of and, and to follow when you see changes occur. The first one is identified as stage one, and it's um, no detectable speech disorder. So often at this time, I, I hear people say, you know, I don't really need to be with, you know, meet with the speech pathologist at this point. My speech is completely clear. Everyone understands me. I have no changes. Um, but it's really important at this stage, even when no changes are, are obvious, that um, you still follow a, a plan of action or some strategies. And the first one is, is to meet with the speech pathologist as, as soon as possible. What that speech pathologist can do is, is take a baseline measurement of your speech rate, and he or she will be able to use that baseline measure, measurement to gauge changes. Um, and those are definitely necessary and important information when they go to perhaps make a recommendation for a speech generating device. At this stage, your speech pathologist can just provide some general education regarding AAC. What's out there, they can demystify some of those terms. It's not unusual at this stage to perhaps meet with some speech generating device manufacturer consultants just for a demonstration, just to get a better understanding of what these, these devices look like and what it all means. Um, and at this stage, message and voice banking is really, really important. Um, I, I have heard many, many times individuals say um, when they perhaps notice marked changes in their speech that they wish that they had done some banking um, earlier on. And you know what what banking your, your voice and your messages earlier in your journey is, is preferable because it ensures that you capture your voice when it's the most easily recognizable and, and understood. So there, there are differences as I provided when I did the, the brief um, definition explanations, but message banking, again, is the process of creating digital recordings of um, an individual's words or phrases which results in a library of personalized messages. And those messages can later be imported onto a speech generating device. Um, in order to message bank, generally a, a digital recorder is required um, to make some really high quality recordings. But they're often saved as WAV files and your speech pathologist can help you with this process. Voice banking, on the other hand, is the process of creating a customized digital voice, and it uses an extensive speech sample. Um, later on in the slides, I do have a, a couple of links to some sites, um, but you may um, hear Model Talker or Vocal ID as, as two voice banking options. Um, so sooner rather than later is, is really my best advice regarding message um, and voice banking. And actually on this slide there are a couple of links. Um, Toby Dynavox offers um, a free uh, message banking cloud system where you can create your, your um, banked messages and store them in a cloud for later use. And then there is Project Revoice which is an initiative um, from the ALS Association working in partnership with um, an Australian creative agency and a Canadian tech company, I believe. Um, and you know, what they're doing is, is working on an opportunity for individuals to record and digitally um, recreate their voices. I would certainly check, check out the Project Revoice in, um, website for additional information. 
I believe it's an evolving project um, with several phases. And um, according to their website, their goal is to make the full voice cloning available by the end of um, 2018. Um, now we'll move on to stage two, and this one is titled Obvious Speech Disorder with Intelligible Speech. So at this stage, you may begin to notice that your speech is slower or a bit slurred, and that it is probably obvious even to someone who is an unfamiliar listener. Um, and there are definitely, again, a plan of action and some strategies that you know, should be considered um, when, you make, when you notice the, the changes in speech. Again, meeting with your speech pathologist, it's an ongoing part of the process. So again, changes can be documented um, based on that initial rate or that baseline rate, and, and strategies can be provided to you know, help improve some of the challenges with communication. They may be little things that you perhaps just don't even think about, such as um, minimizing some of the environmental infer interference, like the volume on your TV or noisy restaurants, you know, places where it makes it more difficult to be understood. To really be aware of um, your level of fatigue and plan activities accordingly. Um, and I have here on the slide that if speech is clear, but even if speech is not as clear, um, definitely discuss with your speech pathologist the, you know, using a voice amplifier. Um, voice amplifiers can really be used to help minimize fatigue. Um, and by amplifying your voice when you speak, you can use less energy to talk. So your um, speech pathologist can talk to you about voice amplifi um, amplification options, um, what components might be necessary to use a voice amplifier. Stage three is titled Reduction in Speech Intelligibility. And at this point, speech is perhaps becoming even more difficult to understand. There, again, may be even a slower rate of speaking. Um, and it's noted that there is an which is really just a failure to exchange information. Um, the plan of strategies or the actions that are suggested at this stage, again, I, I know I'm sounding like a, a bit of a broken record, but continue to discuss these things with your speech pathologist. They can, again, provide you um, strategies for improving the, the volume or the speaking intelligibility of your speech. Um, they can talk with your communication partners regarding some strategies that they can use to assist you in being understood. At this stage, you may hear your speech pathologist discuss the need to go ahead with an AAC evaluation. And remember, AAC is that augmentative and alternative communication. So typically when a speech pathologist is discussing an AAC evaluation, they're probably considering the use of a speech generating device. Your speech pathologist may also be introducing at this time some, some low-tech um, AAC systems that, um, or perhaps even some higher-tech AAC systems that you might be able to use just for some specific needs, like talking on the telephone or having conversations with people who are not as familiar with your speech. The next stage is um, residual, residual natural speech and AAC. So at this point, if an individual is using AAC, it may become necessary to use it more as the primary method and speech becomes the secondary source. Um, you know, AAC is, is designed to supplement what works. If, you know, people might use a variety of strategies at any given time to make sure that you know, their messages are understood. Um, 
whenever possible, it's super important to develop and to be able to use your AAC system as proficiently as possible before you are relying on it as your primary mode of communication. There are some rules that Medicare and private insurance companies um, have in place for obtaining a speech generating device, and we'll talk about those in, in just a little bit. But um, as soon as possible, if you can get to know the system that you think you'll be using, whether it's the low-tech systems and your potential future high-tech system, um, oftentimes um, speech pathologists have access to the equipment, either for demonstration purposes, um, and, and practicing on it during a therapy session is just a way to become familiar with it. The more familiar you are with your system, the more easily you'll be able to use it um, when you need it. I, I've seen people become frustrated um, when they've just relied on their speech and not become familiar with their systems. And when the time comes that they need to depend on those um, for primary communication purposes, they really get frustrated when they haven't had the opportunity to practice. And the last stage is identified as loss of useful speech. And this is characterized by um, speech um, really not being functional at this point and very difficult to understand. So those AAC systems at this point are primary. Um, and there may be ventilators in use at this point for respiratory support. Um, and so changes or tweaks in AAC systems may be necessary at this, at this stage. Um, your speech pathologist is there to assist you with those changes or those tweaks that occur um, throughout the journey. It's really, really important for you to understand that loss of speech does not equal an inability to communicate. Um, AAC systems come in all shapes and sizes, and they allow individuals to continue to communicate even in the absence of speech. Now we will um, take a bit of a deeper dive into the world of, of AAC, and we'll talk about um, the different forms of AAC as well as really dive into um, some potential low-tech AAC systems and high-tech AAC systems. I'll begin just by just identifying the different forms of AAC. There are um, no-tech systems. And these are systems that don't require an external tool. So these are things that we use all the time throughout our day and include such things as facial expressions and gestures, uh, vocalizations, perhaps sign language. Um, Low-tech systems are those systems that don't need batteries, electricity, or electronics and include things like pen and paper, um, paper-based communication boards and books, and um, low-tech eye gaze boards. And on the next slide, you'll actually see a couple of pictures of what I'm, what I'm referring to with some of those systems. And high-tech systems are those systems that do require electricity, and they typically produce speech. These include um, speech generating devices, perhaps computers that have speaking software on them, um, and tablets that also have apps loaded that are um, designed to provide speech. Okay, here are some of those pictures that I just referenced um, specific to low-tech AAC. So low-tech AAC systems are typically pretty simple, um, inexpensive, and generally easy to learn. Um, they include um, paper-based communication boards, which you can probably get from your speech pathologist. And I think even if you just Google um, communication boards, you will see a variety available for free that you can um, download from the Internet. Um, LCD boards or boogie boards, you maybe have um, heard them referred to as dry erase writing boards. And then over to the far right, you see a picture of um, a low-tech 
eye gaze board. So what that is is a, is a piece of um, plexiglass with a, a communication system um, identified to allow someone who is not perhaps able to use their hands, but a way to use their eyes to communicate with, um, with their communication partners. Low-tech systems are really, really important, um, and they are an essential part of a complete system. Um, oftentimes, low-tech systems are used as a backup to high-tech systems. Um, high-tech systems are, are you know, technology, and um, you know, sometimes technology fails. And so it's really important to have a backup system. So if that high-tech system is unavailable, you've got another strategy to use. Um, you know, there are certain cir um, situations or circumstances where perhaps you don't have a high-tech system available, and being able to, you know, to have a low-tech system to be able to pull out um, is really, really critical. Low-tech systems can be accessed in a variety of ways, including using your hands um, or pointing, um, using gestures. I've seen people um, use, you know, pen lights perhaps. Um, or laser pointers um, and eye movements. Generally, low-tech AAC systems do not have voice output. High-tech AAC um, is often, these are often referred to as SGDs, or um, speech generating devices. And they can range from simple keyboarding devices, which is the, the picture that you perhaps see on, your, um, on the left side of the screen, all the way to fully functioning um, computers. They are considered durable medical equipment, or DME. And they are often funded by Medicare, Medicaid, and most private insurance companies. Depending on which funding source is primary, um, there are you know, differences in, in coverage. Um, but that is something that you should speak to your speech pathologist about. They can certainly guide you in that process in helping to determine um, how much your insurance company um, or your funding source will pay to, to fund the device. If you are going through insurance, a speech pathologist has to be involved. Um, and that's, you know, we talked about that AAC evaluation um, a few slides ago. But your speech pathologist um, makes the recommendation for the appropriate equipment. They are the ones who write the evaluation report, which justifies the need um, for the equipment. Um, when you're going through a process of using a funding source, recommendations are um, based on a current level of functioning and not anticipated future need. So what I mean by that is if someone is able to use their hands, um, but their, their speech is, is severely unintelligible or difficult to understand, then a speech pathologist is going to be able to perhaps make a recommendation for a speech generating device, but maybe not one that uses eye gaze at this point. So staying in contact with your speech pathologist through the process allows for um, alternative access methods to be um, identified and recommended when appropriate. So I, I definitely had, um, especially when I was working for a, a speech generating device manufacturer, several individuals who received devices um, and then at a later point received um, a, a change in the way that they access the device and mounting if necessary. So a mount is, is what you can attach the device to if someone is perhaps positioned in a, in a hospital bed or um, in a recliner in their home or in a wheelchair. But those things can be added on at a later point um, um, throughout the journey if necessary. There are, there are lots of um, rules associated with, with getting devices through insurance companies, and those are conversations that you should have with your speech pathologist. 
at, at one of your initial meetings even, um, just to be able to identify what that funding source is and being able to look into those things ahead of time so that you know what to expect when the time comes perhaps to make a recommendation for a speech generating device. Um, typically, these high-tech AAC systems require um, more training and support than the low-tech systems do, um, and uh, most can be accessed in multiple ways, including using your hands, using a switch for scanning, um, using a head mouse which is generally something that attaches to the device and, and is designed for an individual who has good head control. They can control um, the device through that head control or eye gaze, which is for individuals who um, don't, have a good, don't have good use perhaps of their um, upper or lower extremities or good controlled head movement and then perhaps using their eyes. Is, is a good um, access method to consider at that point. <clears throat> Some other options um, include things like using desktop um, computers or laptops and tablets. Um, those things can often be used as communication devices with voice output. But generally, if that's the case, you need to add hardware or software to those systems. Um, one thing to note, if you are using your own iPad with an app or um, your own desktop computer that you've purchased speaking software for, um, those are generally not covered by most insurance plans. Um, and most don't come with support and training. Um, there are some manufacturers who will or who do offer purchased trainings for individuals who use their own hardware, um, and certainly that is something that you can discuss with your speech pathologist or the device manufacturer. Um, I just want to quickly um, touch base with you on, on the roles of the speech pathologist and the communication partner as changes in, in speech occur. That speech pathologist, um, he or she is there to provide education regarding some of those changes in speech and swallowing. Certainly, they provide ongoing monitoring of those changes um, in speech and can provide strategies and solutions along the way to help with any communication challenges that um, you're perhaps experiencing. Um, they are the ones who um, often discuss AAC with you, um, perform the AAC evaluation, and then help to customize the AAC system once it arrives. So um, once an individual is prescribed a speech generating device, generally that speech pathologist is the one who um, provides assistance with the setup and just some, some ongoing training on implementing or using that device um, across perhaps a variety of situations or with a, a variety of, of communication partners. They can certainly help customize that system to, you know, to meet your needs. Your communication partner, or the person that is involved in the conversation, really does share the responsibility for communication. Um, they are there to assist with um, the development and the implementation of these AAC supports. If someone is using a, a low-tech or a high-tech system that has to be perhaps mounted or um, adjusted based on changes of positioning, that communication partner is, is often the one who assists in making those, those changes. Um, the communication partner helps control the environment in order to um, promote successful communication, and they certainly are there to encourage um, their loved one when communication breakdowns occur. So just some final thoughts. Um, it's really important to be proactive versus reactive. Connecting with your speech pathologist as soon as possible is critical um, to customize a personalized plan of action so that your preferences, your thoughts, your ideas, your wishes are identified right from the get-go. Um, I really encourage you to consider messenger voice banking sooner rather than later. Um, I've never had anyone go through the process um, say to me, oh, that was a waste of time. I wish I hadn't done that. 
So really um, consider that as, as soon as possible. And just remember that you are not alone, that there are resources out there, your speech pathologist, your local ALS association chapter staff, support groups. I've identified um, two really, really great websites that are just chocked full with information. Um, the amyandpals.com website's a really good one, and the um, Boston Children's Hospital, their ALS Augmentative Communication Program, their website just has a wealth of information. And that leads us to the, the final bit of the presentation, which is really just an opportunity, an opportunity to answer any questions that have come in throughout the presentation. I realize this was just a really brief overview, but my goal today was just to identify some of the changes that may occur and then to introduce you to some of the, of the terminology that's out there and, and the um, AAC systems that um, you might come across along your journey. So at this point, Cynthia, I may jump to you to see if there were any questions that come in or if I have access to looking at those questions. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, your carving time out to join us today. And it is clear you have expertise in the communication arena. Um, due to the number of people that we have logged on, uh, we have had to put those incoming lines in the mute mode because of the background noise. However, we do have an opportunity for you to share questions and comments in the chat box in the lower left-hand corner, so please do submit those questions in the chat box. Um, we have had a couple of questions come in, so we'll start with those. Um, Stephanie, I know that you mentioned earlier um, something about speech amplification. So there was a question yep. about um, you may be commenting further on the value of speech amplification and when that might be appropriate. So I think generally, you know, people start thinking about voice amplification in terms of my speech is really clear and easy to understand. It's just the volume that perhaps is a challenge. Um, uh, but, you know, speech, even, even if speech is, is really clear and easy to understand, you use a great deal of energy when you speak. And so by considering a voice amplifier when you speak, you can perhaps um, use less energy to talk, which can minimize fatigue. So, uh, um, uh, you know, th there are voice and there are many voice amplifier options out there. Um, I will tell you, I, I got the best information from the Boston Children's Hospital um, ALS Augcom program site. And one that they recommend is the Luminod Spokeman voice amplifier. Um, when you use a voice amplifier, you also need a headset. And there are a variety of options with those. But the idea is to reduce fatigue when you speak. And sometimes a voice amplifier will take some of the, the pressure off using so much energy to get the speech out. And so it will increase, it will amplify the volume of what you're saying. And even if your speech is not as clear, generally those familiar with the individual can understand what they say, it's oftentimes the volume that makes it difficult. Does that answer the question? Excellent, excellent. And could, you did mention one device that you thought might be helpful. Could you spell that? Yep. So uh, the, the one identified, and I have actually, um, the, the Chicago chapter did purchase this um, particular amplifier for an individual in our area, but it is the Luminod. It's L-U-M-I-N-A-U-D, and it's the Spokeman, S-P-O-K-E-M-A-N voice amplifier. So if you Google the Luminod Spokeman voice amplifier, it should take you to that site. I would absolutely, again, encourage you to either talk with your local um, ALS Association chapter. Perhaps they have voice amplifiers available for you to borrow or to try out, um, or to talk with your speech pathologist about it um, so that you can make 
you know, decisions based on your specific needs. Great, thank you. Thanks. That is so. That information is so practical. Um, we have another question that that's come in that um, is somewhat related, and I know that speech pathologists deal with speaking as well as swallowing challenges. And mm -hmm. there was a question um, that was relayed stating that um, the person can currently speak, however, there are issues with swallowing a lot of swallowing difficulty, and they wanted to know if a person with swallowing difficulty should be evaluated for potential communication support. A, a speech pathologist should absolutely be involved for both speech challenges and swallowing challenges. That speech pathologist will want to make sure that if you are still um, taking food or drink by mouth, that you are safely able to swallow that. So, um, you know, oftentimes if you're working with a speech pathologist at a, a specific ALS clinic, or even if they're not at, um, sp you know, specifically connected with one of the clinics, that speech pathologist should be monitoring both speech and swallowing. So absolutely um, consult with your speech pathologist regarding swallowing as well. Great, thank you so much. I know that that um, that nasal pharynx and trachea are also closely connected. That uh, there's a lot of crossover there. Now, there is, we, yes. We had a question that came in um, about message banking, and I know that you you mentioned a couple different things about voice banking and message banking, things of that nature. But there were really two questions about message banking. Number one. Um, are there web links that describe the process of message banking? And number two, what is the potential cost that might be associated with message banking? So message banking is, is typically very inexpensive. Um, you generally just need a, a digital recorder. Um, I purchased one um, I, on the slide. Um, I don't know if I can navigate back to that. Let me see if I can. Um, I identify. Yeah, I think it's right here. Um, there, I would definitely encourage people to take a peek at the TobyDynavox.com website. There is a link that I've provided on the slide that begins with stage one, no detectable speech disorder. They not only define message banking, but they give you the step-by-step -step process for what you do to, to record and to bank those messages. Um, they suggested using the um, Zoom H1 digital recorder, and I purchased one on Amazon for less than $100, and it's just a high-quality digital recorder that can then, um, those recordings can be uploaded to the message banking site or, or the cloud, if you will, and, and be held um, until you, know, you would need them. But um, they definitely give a really, really good detailed step-by-step -step, um, process for, for getting that done. Great, great. Thank you so much. That's, that's, uh, that information is so practical. And thanks for being able to uh, move back to that so people can see those links. I also want to mention, because we've had several questions related to this, this entire webinar will be recorded, and you can access the entire webinar with a live link within 24 hours on your ALS Association website. In addition to that, the slide deck will also be available. I know we've had several people ask about that. Um, we do have another question. Uh, again, this is a question related to insurance, and you had mentioned this briefly earlier. Does Medicare and or state Medicaid cover speech devices, and of course we know Medicare is a federal program, but Medicaid is um, most often uh, administered by the state, so they may have different benefits or criteria. Right. If Medicare is the primary funding source, they cover 80% of the cost of a speech generating device the access method, and typically the recommended mount. Um, if there is a secondary funding source, such as a state Medicaid or private insurance, um, 
the hope is is that they would pick up the balance. Now, every situation, of course, is unique, and, and private insurance policies um, are all a little bit different. Um, but if you are working with a speech generating device manufacturer, they typically have funding departments, and their job is is to um, kind of help you figure that out, really, um, in combination with your speech pathologist. Um, I've had families call private insurance companies to see if their specific policy covers DME, the durable medical equipment, specifically speech generating devices. But if Medicare is primary, they cover 80% of the cost, and then the supplemental policy will hopefully um, cover the balance. So um, if, if there is still um, some money owed after you know insurance companies or, or Medicare or the insurance have been used, then that is something that that speech generating device manufacturer funding team or funding support person would discuss with the family before um, shipping equipment. Um, at least I can speak for the device manufacturer that I used to work for, and I do believe that all of them follow a very similar process. Oh, great. Thanks so much. And, you know, as you mentioned um, earlier, sooner rather than later is so valuable because, number one, um, no one really knows what the progression of the disease may be. And then also, um, you mentioned that particularly with insurance and evaluation by a speech-language pathologist is required, and that may take a, a number of weeks or whatever to set that up. Um, so very important for people to reach out sooner than later. Stephanie, can, can you tell us about how long that evaluation with the speech language pathologist takes as far sure. as being evaluated? So if you have been meeting with your speech pathologist very early on, the discussion of AAC should, should come up rather quickly, even when it's not something that you need today. Um, your speech pathologist, as soon as um, changes in the speech are causing communication to be difficult or speech to be difficult to understand, it is appropriate to proceed with these AAC evaluations. Every speech pathologist does them a little bit differently. Um, you know, I've had speech pathologists who do the evaluation in one speech therapy session. Depending on the funding source, or individual preference, a trial of that equipment may or may not be necessary. If a trial is necessary, um, the funding source dictates perhaps the length of that trial, how long it needs to be before a recommendation can be made. Um, if no trial is necessary and at the time of the evaluation um, an appropriate system um, has been identified, then the speech pathologist has a pretty lengthy report to um, write and submit. Um, their, uh, the doctor needs to sign a script um, agreeing with the recommendation for the equipment. And you know, once all of this paperwork is received, um, it is sent to the speech generating device manufacturer who typically goes through all of the documentation that's received to make sure that it's complete. If it's not complete, there's some time that, that may pass while corrections are being made or the appropriate documentation is, um, you know, comes in. And then once it's submitted to the funding source, then I wish I could give you a definitive length of time, but that can vary depending on the funding source and the review time. Um, it, is, it is certainly um, not as fast as it was 10 years ago when I began working for um, a speech generating device manufacturer, but, um, you know, I, I really can't give you a definitive amount of time. I would guess that, you know, it could take anywhere from eight weeks plus perhaps to receive some equipment um, after the initial evaluation takes place. 
And again, I, I really want to stress that the speech pathologist can make a recommendation based on someone's current needs and abilities, not anticipated future needs. So Medicare won't purchase a system with eye gaze for someone who doesn't need eye gaze today. So just, just something else to, to keep in the back of your head and just to remember how important it is to really monitor changes and communicate those changes with your speech pathologist so that as changes occur, then that process can begin. Aha, uh -huh. that sounds like the rock in the hard place. Better sooner than later, however, um, most yeah. insurance will not pay for anticipated loss or need. Right. So it really, really is important then to um, be, ver be proactive with regard to monitoring the changes in your ability to communicate. Um, a couple more questions. We have lots of questions um, today. Um, tell me, there was a question related to the, the pad. We mentioned several different types of devices and mm -hmm. switches or way to access how that device operates. Is there a different pathway to an appropriate communication device if you lose your voice but you have limb control versus if you lose your limb control and then your voice? Um, speech generating devices are, are often purchased because of the inability to speak. Um, there is technology available that um, is not funded um, that anyone can purchase. Um, for example, there is um, Toby Dynavox has a standalone eye gaze or an eye tracker that can be attached to um, a PC or a laptop. Um, I, I absolutely had people purchase those out of pocket because they were able to speak. Um, they wanted to be able to control their computer using their, their, um, their gaze. So there are some solutions that are available um, for private purchase or purchase out of pocket um, when it's not appropriate to go through insurance. So again, I would talk to your speech pathologist about your, your current needs um, and your abilities and what you're looking to do, and um, he or she should, should help you, you know, figure out what, what's available, what systems are available to help meet your needs you know, based on your current circumstances. Again, I would always check with your local um, ALS Association chapter and see if you know, there is equipment available to borrow or to loan um, if you either want to trial or perhaps you need something that can't be justified through insurance at, at, at the current time. They may have something available um, for you to temporarily use. Great, great. Thank you so much. Um, another question similar to this is if I lose my voice, can I use my hands to access the speech generating device? Yes, most speech generating devices can be accessed in multiple ways. Almost all of them have some sort of touch screen interface where you can use your hands or you can use a stylus. Um, many times if they're fully functioning computers, you can um, plug in a, a wired or wireless mouse and use a mouse to control the screen. So most of the higher tech systems allow you to use um, multiple access methods um, as your needs change. If it's something like eye gaze or it's an extra piece of equipment, that's when you want your speech pathologist involved so that they can make a recommendation for a, a change that's necessary due to um, a change in motor status perhaps, and then they can submit an addendum regarding the, the need for a change in the access. Um, the way you access the device. There are certain speech generating devices that are not eye gaze accessible. Not that everyone will need eye gaze, but again, that's a really important conversation to have with your speech pathologist. Um, some speech generating devices can allow for that add-on at a later point, and some speech generating devices or tablets, let's say, that you use via um, you know, hand control 
um, may, maybe cannot be accessed at a later point. So even though an insurance company is not going to pay for a system with eye gaze, let's say today, if that need arises and I, I have a system that allows for that add-on at a later date, then I can continue to use that system and get that access method changed added to the system that I'm currently using. So even though you, you can't get something based on anticipated need, you still want to discuss um, what that future need might look like and if the system you're deciding on will allow for that change in the future. Great, great. So it sounds like some units are designed to be accessed via motor skills or hands or something of that nature. Some are designed to be accessed via eye gaze or some other um, mode of access, and some of them actually have the ability to be adaptable as the disease progresses and a different mode of access is needed. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly. Okay, great, great. Thanks so much. There are so many folks um, lying on a wide paradigm here. Um, you know, here's a, here's a great question. Uh, and you've probably uh, had experience with this. Uh, someone is sharing that their mom is using an eye gaze system right now. However, there is an issue with regard to um, the placement of that unit because mm -hmm. the device is designed to be used when they are in bed and then when they move up in the bed or when they have to transfer to their wheelchair, uh, their device is no longer working and it has to be recalibrated. Is there some kind of mount that can assist people with elevating the head of the bed or, or moving from bed to a wheelchair? So mounting, especially with eye gaze, is critical because the device has to be positioned in such a way that it can be appropriately accessed. And when I change my position, then the change of the device relative to my change in position needs, needs to happen. And there are different mounting options. Um, some funding sources allow for combination mounts, which include you know, perhaps something like a rolling floor stand mount that may allow me to use the device while I'm positioned in a bed. And then um, they may also allow me access to a wheelchair mount that would allow the device to be appropriately positioned when I'm in a, a chair. Depending on the actual speech generating device, you may not have to recalibrate. What you may have to do is reposition. So, you know, generally, um, once a good calibration is obtained, um, you don't often have to recalibrate, but you will have to reposition the device based on my change in movement so that the device is still reading my eyes. I see. That's important, important in the details because, as you mentioned, if you are being evaluated in a clinic or in a speech pathologist's office, you're probably sitting either in your wheelchair or in a chair, but the reality is you need to communicate at home when you're, when you're in bed or on your sofa or on your wheelchair or in your car. So that mounting um, aspect is really important with regard to those units. Yeah, that, again, those are discussions that you know, need to be have with the, had with the speech pathologist, and hopefully those are considerations that are taking place. You know, where is the device going to be used most frequently? If the funding source only allows for one mount, which one is going to allow you to use the device in you know, most of the situations you're in? If you only um, you know, use the device or you're only using a wheelchair when you go to doctor's appointments, and those are only, let's say, once a month and the rest of the time you spend at home in a, in a hospital bed or in a recliner, then perhaps the floor stand mount is the smarter solution because it will allow you, you know, to access the device in, in multiple situations. It just really depends. Every, everyone's situation is unique um, and everyone's funding source might look a little bit different. Um, so having those conversations with your speech pathologist and, and really communicating, you know, about when and where you'll be needing to use the device are important so that the appropriate equipment can be recommended. 
great, great. Access is, uh, different types of access is so important. And we did have a comment here, um, and this is probably related to switch devices or accessing um, communication devices, and that is the use of live neural operating devices as a switch or a link to communication devices. Is that yet uh. another um, pathway to access a communication device? You know, I don't have the information. I don't. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I think that you know the best thing to do is, um, if, if it's specific to a speech generating device, you know, technology changes so quickly that having that com conversation with the device manufacturer or consultant regarding that specific technology would be, you know, the the, the best way to go. Excellent. Excellent. And thanks so much. We particularly appreciate you providing uh, links online so people can look up uh, additional information. I am aware that there are some trials going on related to using uh, neurological signals to access devices. Those may still be in clinical trial um, process, but uh, certainly people can look on the Internet if they are interested in accessing or using neurological signals um, to link up with a communication device. Um, here we do have another question related to insurance. Um, and it, it states that Medi this person understands Medicare allows a subscriber to get medical equipment once every three years. And they are wondering whether they should get a wheelchair or a transdermal throat amplifier. So Stephanie, the Medicare, and we're not talking about Medicaid, we're talking about federal Medicare, does fund speech generating devices separately from mobility power wheelchair devices. Is that correct? That is correct. And it's my understanding, unless something has changed, that um, it's every five years that they allow for um, an update or change in speech generating device equipment. Um, that's not to say that I can't add a, an access method later, but as far as the device is concerned, unless that has changed, that is my latest understanding. But yes, mobility um, and speech generating devices, so wheelchairs and speech generating devices, although both considered durable medical equipment, are covered separately. Very good. Um, and what's interesting is, although they are covered separately, there may be some overlap in that if you are using a power wheelchair, you may be able to integrate the switches um, in your power wheelchair that your power wheelchair is capable of providing with your communication or environmental controls. Is that correct? Yes. I had an individual use a joystick on um, his wheelchair to control um, his speech generating device. So yes, um, oftentimes when we're, we're doing some combination with the power chair and the speech generating device, um, it was really important for me at least as a, as a device consultant to connect with the wheelchair, wheelchair manufacturer and they were um, a critical component in, in making all of those things happen, all of those connections occur. Well, you know, that certainly goes to support the value of a multidisciplinary clinic because I know if folks are, are, are attending clinic, they have the opportunity to see the uh, speech pathologist as well as the physical therapist or OT or APP. So when people are looking at devices, it's probably important to get the different disciplines together to ensure the power wheelchair that is being recommended or you're considering um, will be adaptable if you're looking at anticipating uh, speech generating devices, access to either speech or environment. Um, so that's great. Again, something um, probably valuable for people to consider and start asking questions a little bit sooner than later. Right. Um, oh, and we do have another comment about um, accessing speech devices via neural operating. Um, systems. Apparently there is a, some information about that that people can find at nuro.ca. So do not have that on the slide, but someone shared that information with us. Um, Great. There. Thank you. Um, 
Also, you know, we have a, a, an interesting suggestion here. I know that um, you had mentioned revoice and some of the voice messaging options, but um, sometimes people lose their voice so rapidly that they really miss the window to record either their voice or their messages. And someone shared um, that they thought it might be a good idea if people were willing to allow maybe a close relative to record the messages that the diagnosed person indicates. And the voice would be in their close relative, but it would be similar. I'm sure that would probably enable people to insert their local accent um, into their messaging if that's appropriate. And you know, most of the, well, all of the, the high-tech speech generating devices certainly come with um, a variety of, of synthesized voice options. But you know, yes, they are you know, synthesized voices. They're computer-generated voices. And anywhere where you can add some personalization or some you know, customization that makes it feel more like you is, you know, a, is a really great strategy. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it just makes the, the exchange much more personal. Great, great. Um, thanks so much. Um, we are coming close to the end of our allocated time, so, um, but I do have two more quick questions here. Um, uh, someone is asking about eye gaze apps for Google versus Apple programs. Is there a difference? Well, the, the dedicated speech generating devices, the ones that I know of, typically are on a, a Windows or a, a Windows platform. Um, but I have heard um, of, of you know of rumors that you know that in the Apple world or um, on on i technology that some i gaze um, is becoming available. I really don't have specific information on it. Um, if you are not using a dedicated um, SGD speech generating device and you're using commercially available technology, um, certainly you should consider it. Just you know, keep in mind that, 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 that those systems are often not um, supported and that they don't come with you know, um, a, a device consultant or someone who's available available to provide some training or some tech support. So certainly something to look into, but just to consider. Great, great. So again, contacting your speech pathologist or the company that is providing uh, the manufacturing uh, representative that is providing that unit for you. Um, yep, yep. Great, great. There is uh, one app that I didn't mention that um, uh, I certainly think is a really good app for those who are perhaps wanting to explore what it, what it looks like or they need something te temporarily. But there is an app called Speech Assistant AAC, um, and it's really one of my favorites for being a rather inexpensive but comprehensive app. I believe that iTunes sells it for around $9.99, and I, I was really amazed by how much is, um, can, is, is available within that app and how much customization can be done directly in that app, including um, making recordings directly within that app. Um, so for someone who is, is looking for something and they perhaps don't, you know, aren't at the point where they need a high-tech system or a speech generating device, um, that is, is an app that um, is one of my favorites. Oh, great. Thanks. And would you repeat that one more time? Sure. It's um, Speech Assistant AAC is the name of the app. And I believe it's on both platforms, both on, um, available on iPads and on um, Android-based systems. Excellent, excellent. And Stephanie, do you have your contact information available for folks? As well? You know, I, I just thought about that before um, uh, I started. I can give you my um, email address, but I did not list that on the slides. So if anyone has questions or they want to reach out to me, um, even if I can't provide the answer, hopefully I can direct you to someone who can. But my email address is Stephanie, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E, -E, at Alsa Chicago, A-L-S-A-C-H-I-C-A-G-O dot org.
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we just have one more comment. Actually, we have another, another request for that website related to neural operating devices. Um, and I can share with you that is www.nuro.ca. So, Stephanie, we have actually run over our allocated time. We had so many people logged on. Thank you for sharing that valuable information and for making yourself available for so many questions. As I mentioned previously, this entire webinar is being recorded. You can access that within 24 hours on the ALSA.org website, or you can reach out to your local ALS Association chapter. In addition to the recorded webinar, the slide deck will be available. And please um, look at, to your local chapter for our next scheduled educational topic call. Next month, we will be discussing talking with children in youth in ALS families. Thank you so much, and I wish everyone on the phone who's able to join us a very safe remaining summer season. Thank you.